I read a powerful quote on something Billy Graham said many years ago. He said that 75% of patients in hospitals would be made whole if they would only forgive. Think about that. Some people hold on to certain emotions, certain negative emotions for so long, and eventually those emotions manifest themselves in sickness. Proverbs 14 verse 30 says, A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. Envy is a feeling of jealousy. It's resentment. And the Bible tells us that envy, an internal emotion, rots the bones, meaning it has a physical, external result. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 to 15 says, Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Notice that this verse doesn't even warn us to be cautious of bitterness itself. It warns us to be cautious of the root, the root of bitterness. Now the root of a plant is not visible to the naked eye. We may only be aware that a seed was planted when we see the fruit. So when the Bible says, see to it that no root of bitterness springs up, it's because this emotion of bitterness is so destructive that it needs to be uprooted as soon as the seed germinated. The Bible is telling us not to even wait until you see the fruit of bitterness. Cut it off at the root. And so, dear listener, I'm aware that in this life, all of us will experience unpleasant emotions at one point or another. We will experience the pain of betrayal. We'll experience heartache and loss. We might even suffer maltreatment and injustice. But my message to you is that you should learn to forgive. Learn to let go. Don't hold on to everything negative. Pray for the Lord to heal your wounds. Pray for the Lord to mend your broken heart. Pray that you would be someone who doesn't repay evil with evil, but instead have the love of Christ and repay evil with good. I encourage you to pray for God to give you the capacity to be able to forgive and move on. Don't live a life where you're imprisoned by toxic emotions. No, Jesus Christ offers you peace joy, victory, despite what people do to you. In Jesus, you can have freedom. You can have life and have it more abundantly. Have you ever been in a situation where you don't understand whether God is trying to teach you something or if he's punishing you? Have you ever been brought to your knees and prayed, Lord, help me to trust you even though I don't understand this situation. Help me to have faith in you even if I don't understand my present circumstances. I'm sure we've all been through this in our walk with Christ. And in these moments, these moments of being tested and facing difficulties, it can be hard to remain positive or prayerful. And the Bible actually tells us to expect afflictions in our lives. And there is no denying that pain is real. There's someone listening right now and they're in pain. There's someone listening right now and they're suffering in some sort of pain. But allow me to encourage you and tell you that the longer you live, the more you come to understand that there will be times when it feels as though God is breaking you, when in actual fact, He is building you. You may look at pain and suffering and heartache and say, God, where are you? But perhaps that kind of perspective is wrong, because I firmly believe that God can use pain to shape us, to mold you, to prepare you, and even to build you. Think about the story of Joseph. Joseph was a faithful servant of God, yet was betrayed by his own brothers, sold into slavery, falsely accused, imprisoned, and forgotten. Joseph suffered setback after setback in his life, even though he did nothing wrong. And even though it might have felt like God was breaking him, God was actually building him. 
God was building his faith, his tenacity, and his strength so that at the proper time, God might elevate him to a position he never would have thought possible. The Bible says in James chapter 1, verse 2 to 4, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. The suffering that we know is temporary as children of God because the only suffering we will know is on this side of the grave. Because in heaven, there will be no pain. Where there is loss, there will be restoration. Where there is defeat, there will only be victory. Where there are tears, there will only be joy in God's presence. Do you know what Joseph said in Genesis 50 verse 20? At the end of his trials, Joseph said, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. What would happen if we had that same attitude towards our own suffering? What would happen if we adopted the same mindset in times of tribulation? I find it interesting that Romans chapter 5, verse 3 to 5 says, Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Rejoicing in suffering does not mean that we enjoy pain. On the contrary, rejoicing in suffering means that we fully understand the size of our troubles, but we trust that our God is bigger. We know that through our suffering, God is refining our character, teaching us the value of hope, and making us more dependent on Him. None of these things are pleasant in the moment, but they are necessary for our maturity, our growth, and our ultimate joy. The Word of God says in Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make straight your paths. Trusting in the Lord with all your heart means trusting when you don't understand. Trusting in the Lord with all your heart means trusting in Him when it's painful to do so. Trusting in the Lord with all your heart means that you might have no answer to all the questions you have. You may have no answers to all the questions of life. But you will still have faith that God can and will make a way. One thing that cripples our faith as believers is the tendency to want to understand everything. We are humans trying to understand the workings of an almighty, heavenly, all-knowing God. But saints, we need to get to a stage where we pray that God would help and teach us not to lean on our own understanding because our understanding is limited and flawed. So even without the full plan and detail, I want you to know that it's God who orchestrates all of the challenges in your life so that each test each mountain, each Goliath might serve a purpose in strengthening your character or solidifying your faith. I want you to know that it's God who orders our steps through both the good and tough situations. So rather than always praying for answers, why don't you try praying that the will of the Lord would be accomplished? God is faithful regardless of my present circumstances. He is faithful regardless of your present circumstances. Romans 8:28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. This means that if God sends a storm my way, it's for my good. If He sends a blessing my way, it's for my good. If He allows Pharaoh and his army to chase after me, it's for my good. I truly believe that when the Bible says all things work together for good to those who love God, it means that I may have to embrace tough or difficult circumstances sometimes. But joy is just around the corner. If God has to take me through a test in order for me to find out that He can make a way where there seems to be no way, then may His will be done. Should God choose to send enemies to surround me so that I can see Him prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies? then may His will be done. 
allow me to offer some encouragement to you. The first thing I'd like to tell you is that regardless of everything seemingly going wrong, I want you to know that Jesus is still king. He still rose from the dead. He still loves you. Job 13 verse 15 says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Even so, I will defend my own ways before him. Those are deep words, people of God. Those are profound words. After everything that Job has suffered, after everything he has lost, after facing some incredibly difficult challenges, this man is able to say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Pray for faith like this. Pray for grace like this, so that in the middle of your challenge, you can still say, I will trust in God. In the middle of your challenge, remember that Jesus Christ remains King. He remains seated on the right hand of the Father. He remains to be the only one who has said the words, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And yes, He still loves you. Having this knowledge, my friends, is the key to finding our way back to a place of strength, a place of joy and victory. God is good all the time, not sometimes, not some days, but all the time. And should you face the hardships of life, should you encounter the many afflictions that we all face in life, then we have a promise to hold on to. And that promise is that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Regardless of the type of trouble you face or the form it comes in, so long as you are in the Lord, you will overcome. When I read Jeremiah 33 verse three, which says, call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. When I read that scripture, I hear the word of God telling me to pray about it. Whatever situation you face today, whatever circumstances or situation, God wants you to call on him. Psalms 50 verse 15 says, call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will honor me. That means pray about it. So let your hope be found in God. He says, trust me in your times of trouble and I will rescue you. He says, abide in me and I will restore you. He says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. As Christians, we're not immune to the hardships of life. And in fact, many would argue that we face more hardships than non-Christians. After all, the Bible does say in Psalm 34, verse 19, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Take note here how the Bible says many are the afflictions. Now, I'm not telling you this so that you would be discouraged, but rather so that you would be grounded in your perspective. Loving Jesus Christ, living for Jesus Christ, doesn't mean you'll have a life that's free from any problems. Equally, when you face challenges or pain, this doesn't mean the Lord loves you any less than someone else. You see, God doesn't promise us a life that is devoid of suffering, pain, problems, or difficult situations. As a matter of fact, he tells us the opposite. In John 16, verse 33, the Bible says, These things I have spoken to you, 
that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. But you see, after Jesus warns us of the many troubles we're to face in the world, in the same verse, he commands us to be of good cheer, for he has overcome the world. And so, I may not know what you're going through, but here's my message to you today. Be of good cheer, because in Jesus, you are an overcomer. Things might be tough right now. Everything might not be all right. But be of good cheer. Have faith in the Lord, and I declare to you that He will see you through. There are times you have to encourage yourself. There are times that you will have to learn to talk to yourself and tell yourself the promises of God. Tell yourself who God says you are. And when you do this, you will find that it will lift you up to walk on top of your situation rather than underneath it. It will lift your faith. Tell yourself the word of God, such as Nahum chapter 1, verse 7. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust him. Tell yourself Isaiah 40, verse 29. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Tell yourself Deuteronomy 31 verse 8, The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. I'm about to read to you a very crucial passage of scripture that's in the Bible. As I read these verses, I want you to take special note of what the Bible says about your heart, your mouth, your eyes and feet. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 to 27 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or the left. Remove your foot from evil. It's a key thing to note that this passage of Scripture begins and starts by talking about the heart. Think about your physical heart. If you have a bad heart, then the rest of your body's in jeopardy. If the heart quits working, then everything else quits working. You can't have a dead heart and a healthy ear. Same is true with our spiritual heart. If the heart is good, then what flows out is good. However, if the heart is bad, what flows out of our heart will be bad. Guarding your heart can be challenging because the heart is attacked from so many different angles. This world and its pleasures are after your heart. Satan is after your heart, and our own sinful flesh wants to attack and fill our hearts with sin. And when we're having a hard day or going through tough times, it can be easy for our hearts to drift away. The next area we need to be careful of is our mouths. We are to put away our perverse speech. Our mouth actually reveals what's going on in our hearts. If there's evil in our hearts, if there's sin, our mouths will reflect that. The words and actions that flow from our mouths reveal where our heart is actually at. We may look spiritual from the outside, however, our words will reveal our spirituality. And now to the eyes. We're to keep our spiritual eyes directly forward. Think about your physical eyes. If you're driving, you don't keep your eyes directly forward, you're going to get in some real trouble. Some of the worst crashes are because our eyes are focused on something else, such as a phone or somebody in the back seat. And our spiritual eyes can do the same thing. When we turn our eyes away from the Lord, we're prone to stumble. And the final area mentioned in this passage of Scripture is all to do with your feet. 
When we focus on keeping our feet on the path, we move in the right direction. If you're going for a walk on a trail and you decide to get off the trail, you're much more likely to get lost. However, if you focus on keeping your feet on the trail, your path is laid out. Yet again, the same is true spiritually. If you follow the moral path God's laid for you, you will not stumble. However, as you seek your own path, it becomes so much easier to stumble. I encourage you to pray that your heart would not be drawn to sin. Pray that your mouth would not be filled with perverse words. Pray for your eyes to remain focused on God and for your feet to be led by the lamp that is the Word of God. We have to be guarded, even in a season of pain, because sometimes that's when we're most vulnerable. Everyone has and will suffer hurt in life. We all have to endure some kind of wound, suffer some type of disappointment, suffer wounds and scars that should have, could have, and probably still can destroy. Destroy your faith, kill your hope, destroy the trust in a marriage, steal the future of a young man, or taint the eyes of a young lady. The enemy does come to steal, kill, and destroy if you're not guarded. He doesn't need an invitation to come in and attack, but the mistakes that we think is that when the devil attacks a believer, it should be fire and brimstone. Some think of a grim reaper lookalike, but no, it's problem after problem. It's issue after issue, one thing after another, with an intention to wear you down, get you to a state of being sick and tired. Why do you think the Bible tells that they who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength? It's so you won't get tired of this enemy. For every season in life, the Word of God has an answer. When you are worried, Philippians 4 verse 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Should you be in a season where the future appears to be uncertain and the unknown makes you fearful, 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, perhaps you are unsettled within you. Maybe there are issues you are dealing with and they've left your heart in a restless state. Well, John 14 verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I urge you today to get to know the Word of God for yourself. Get God's Word within you. Read scripture as often as you can, memorize Bible verses and meditate on them as often as you can, because when you go through the many seasons of life, the ups and downs of this life, it's only what is in you that will sustain you. And if the Word of God is in you, then you will survive. You will make it by the grace of God and the power in His Word. Now, the reason why it's so vital for us to meditate on God's Word is because we're told in Joshua 1 verse 8 that, Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. The Word of God has an answer for us throughout every season of life. And so we must be anchored in God's Word and our prayers must be rooted in Scripture. And what I mean, people of God, is that we need to speak the Word of God over ourselves. We need to declare the Word of God in our lives. We need to confess it. And I believe that we need to assert the Word of God as the governing authority over our lives. 
And what I mean by saying that we need to assert the word of God is, when you look at the definition of the word assert, it means state a fact or belief confidently and forcefully. It means to state with assurance, with confidence, or to state strongly. So that's what I'd like to encourage you to do. State the word of God confidently at all times. State the word of God forcefully when the enemy tries to attack you, when he tries to attack your home, when he tries to attack your family. State the word of God with power. State it strongly and speak with assurance. I say all of this because when God speaks, things happen, things change. And dear saints, God has spoken to us through his word. This is why we're told in Matthew 24, verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Have you ever seen a professional pianist play? Have you ever heard how they can command the keys and their hands just seem to glide up and down that piano? When you see a pianist performing on stage and in front of hundreds of people, you see them perform as the finished article. What you don't see is the years and years of dedication the years and years of commitment and practice. Behind them are years and years of doing the same things over and over again. Day in, day out, they developed strong habits, habits that eventually helped them achieve remarkable things. And this is the key. What you do daily, what you do consistently, shapes a lot more than you think in your life. Let's take this concept of reaping and sowing. Galatians chapter 6 verse 8 says, Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Think of it this way. If you develop a habit of satisfying your sinful desire? If day in and day out you are engaged in that which is worldly, if you consistently invest in the flesh, then the Bible says you will reap corruption because all things relating to the flesh are temporary. They will pass away. But whoever sows into the Spirit, when you sow into the Spirit, that means that day in and day out, you're investing in the things of the Lord. You are about your father's business. In practical terms, it means you're living a Christian life where your prayer is a daily habit. Reading the word of God is a daily habit. And you see, it's these habits that will begin to transform your life. The more time you consistently spend in God's Word and in prayer, the more you will grow as a believer. If you were impulsive, you will find that the Holy Spirit will enable you to have self-control. If you were judgmental to others or full of pride, the Holy Spirit will enable you to have humility and love your neighbor. And of all the habits that we need to develop, I believe daily communion with the Holy Spirit is absolutely paramount. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18 says, Don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, this means that you are constantly guided by Him. You're always led by the Spirit rather than our sinful nature. It's a state of dependency. You are no longer dependent on yourself, on your resources, or your circle of influence, but you are dependent on the Holy Ghost day in and day out. This is why it's so important to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So look at your habits. 
And if they are not causing you to grow in faith and grow in the Lord, pray for change. We can't always change our circumstances, but we can change our attitude and our outlook. We can choose to feed our spirit with God's word and reject the spirit of fear. So wherever you're at right now, you are not there by accident. God has placed you where you are. The fight you face, the battle you're in, it all has a purpose. In the fullness of his timing, the Lord will make a way for you. Let us pray. King Jesus, the Almighty One, teach us to be more trusting. Help us to build our faith. May the Holy Ghost teach us and remind us that the troubles we face serve a purpose. The pain that we feel, the people who reject us, can all be a blessing in disguise. The tough situations and trials we go through can be the Lord ordering our steps, positioning us for increase, for healing, for breakthrough. We ought to hold on to the promises like those found in Psalm 55 verse 22, which says, Cast your burden on the Lord, and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. You see, in times of difficulty, we have to remember God's nature, and his nature can be found in his word. In the Bible, God is described as a refuge and a deliverer. He is described as faithful. He is described as Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is patient, caring, and loving. And so, I encourage you to put your trust in the Lord regardless of what you are facing. Whether you are in a valley or on top of the mountain, we should be seeking the Lord always. We need Him to lead and guide us. We need His grace. We need His mercy. We need His protection to keep us safe as we go about our business. And above all, we need God's presence. Some of us are so comfortable that God has to send a challenge into our lives just to get our attention and get us to pray. So before you go questioning God about your healing or why did this have to happen to me, be mindful that God loves you. However, His ways are higher than our ways. Mark 8 verse 36, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Friends, I would like to ask you, what would it profit you to live a healthy life but be so comfortable that your relationship with God suffers and you end up being cast in hell? Jesus said, It's better to enter eternal life with only one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. And I pray that you see. It's better to suffer pain in this body and go to heaven, a place where there is no pain or sorrow for eternity, it's better than living a pain-free life, only to be tormented in hell for the rest of eternity. Now, as we continue to place our hope and faith in Jesus, we need to know that one day, the storm will be over. You will make it through to the other side. God will make rivers flow in the desert. So, dear friend, whatever you are going through, it shall pass. Maybe you're in a dry season, a season where life seems meaningless and you feel as though you're simply drifting. Perhaps you're at a place where God seems as distant as the stars. Maybe you're in an impossible situation where no matter what you choose, you just can't win. For some of us, that tough place has become a stronghold of sin, and you can't seem to let it go. No matter what your problem may be, it will pass, and God will do a new thing in your life. 
Furthermore, all of us, despite what we face, we must keep moving forward in believing. Philippians 3, verse 13 to 14 says, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. In other words, saints, press on. God is faithful to empower you to stand strong and victorious and not to be defeated. Remember that Jesus is victorious over Satan. He's victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And this is good news. This is good news for you and I because if we have accepted Jesus Christ into our hearts, then we too can walk in victory. So whatever situation you face today, whatever circumstance or situation you're up against, God wants you to call on Him. Jeremiah 33 verse 3 says, Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. Psalm 50 verse 15 says, Call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will honor me. And so, I want to encourage you. When you look at God's word, when you look at his promises, he says, trust me in your times of trouble, and I will rescue you. He says, abide in me, and I will restore you. He says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So let your hope be found in God. He has the perfect solution each and every time. So call on Him, whether it's day or night. When the bills are paid, when there's money in the bank, when there's plenty to laugh and be happy about, do you remember to say, thank you, Lord? I know where you've brought me from. I remember when it wasn't like this. Or how about when you're struggling? Work is tough. The business isn't performing well and you have problems. Do you remember to say, thank you? Thank you, Lord, because I may be hard pressed on every side, but I'm not crushed. I may be perplexed, but I'm not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. In Acts 16, Paul and Silas didn't see the prison they were in. They didn't focus on the guards, the chains, or the fact that they were uncomfortable. They focused on God. Acts 16 verse 25 and 26 says, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. I pray that this may be the reality in our lives today. As we praise and thank God in advance, each of us will also experience a suddenly movement in our situation when things will turn around. Be thankful, saints. Be thankful always and in all circumstances. How could I not thank the Lord? How could you not thank the Lord? I am living. I am healthy. I am of a sound mind. I am blessed to have a family. Blessed to have food on my plate and a place to stay. This is not to say that everything has been perfect. But the message I want to tell you is, be thankful. Find something, find one thing to be thankful about. We should be believers that rejoice and give thanks to God Almighty through the good and through the bad. Sure, the car broke down, but I thank you for legs that I can walk. 
Maybe I lost my job. It's a problem. But I can still thank God that I haven't lost my health. Yes, you may not be able to afford the most luxurious dining experience, but thank God that you have never missed a meal. People of God, we ought to have a spirit of thankfulness. Let it be your disposition in life to stop for a moment and say thank you. Psalms 107 verse 1 to 2 says, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble. Fear is a liar, because fear leads you to forget all that God has done. One description of fear that I like says, fear is false evidence appearing real. Fear creates a cloud that makes you think you are alone. It creates a cloud that makes you blind to God's promises and His Word. And one way fear manifests itself in today's society is in the prevalence of anxiety disorders, stress-related diseases, and health conditions. Anxiety and stress are both the children of fear. We fear the future. We fear the past. We fear things we cannot control. And we don't want to admit that most of life is out of our control. We are not in control of when we're born or when we die. We are reminded of our lack of control when faced with an unwanted diagnosis or a natural disaster. This is why Jesus invites us and commands us not to worry. Matthew 6 verse 25 tells us, Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Jesus goes on to say in verse 33, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Jesus is telling us to let go of the illusion that we are the ones in control. Because while we are not in control, God is sovereign. He's always in control. While we don't know the future, God is already in the future. While we can't let go of the past, God is already in the past, working out your present and your future. The devil is the father of fear, but God is the master of the future. The devil is the warlock of worry, but Jesus is the prince of peace. The devil is the architect of anxiety, but the Holy Spirit is the conduit of comfort. The Lord tells us in Isaiah 41, verse 10, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. As believers, our lives should not be dictated by fear, but rather our faith. Our lives should not be crippled by worry, but rather empowered by encouragement. Now, we all have that one Bible verse, that one passage of scripture that speaks to us like no other. And for me, I find Psalm 16, verse 8 to be that one Bible verse that I can always turn to. And this verse says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand I shall not be moved. Many times when I have been afraid, I have held on to this word. Many times when I have been wrestling with uncertainty, I have turned to Psalm 16 verse 8 and this is how I apply the verse in my life. I have set the Lord always before me. In other words, God orders my steps. 
The Lord goes ahead of me to clear my path, or rather, God is in front of me. He is already in my future. And when it says, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved, I claim and declare that the Lord is by my side. I am anchored in Jesus. I am rooted in Jesus. I am joined with him and therefore I cannot be moved. I will not be shaken, not because of my own strength or might, but because of the one who lives inside my heart. So I would like to offer some advice to you today. Find your scripture. Find a passage in the Bible that speaks to your heart. Find a verse to hold on to. Psalm 16 verse 8 gives me hope because I can say whatever the future holds, whatever is in store for me, I have set the Lord always before me. If tomorrow comes, if tomorrow never comes, I have set the Lord always before me. If my friends leave me and abandon me in the near future, if my boss at work doesn't honor his promises, if my pastor falls from grace, I will not be moved or shaken because I have set the Lord always before me. So I encourage you to do the same. Find your verse. Find the verse that will shift your focus from the problem in front of you to the God who has promised to fight your battles. The Word of God is there to offer us direction. It's there to inspire and strengthen our faith. If you've ever seen someone with bad eyesight, you'll find that the simplest of activities will become difficult. Now, a Christian who hasn't got the Word of God in them is like a person with bad eyesight. Without the Word of God, you have no idea the protection you've been given. Without the Word of God, you cannot see that you've been offered peace beyond understanding. The Word of God reveals things to you. You begin to see the devil for who and what he really is, a deceiver and the father of all lies. You begin to see the passion of Christ, the love and passion that led him to be wounded for our transgressions, to be bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. The Word of God reveals all of that. The Word of God is sight to a Christian. This is why it's important that you obey Joshua 1 verse 8, which says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. You must meditate on the word so that you can keep your eyes on the Lord. When you have the word hidden in your heart, you will always have a reason to say, it is well with me. If you're struggling and can't seem to find a way out of the mess you're in, fix your sight. Keep your eyes on Jesus and on his word. Whether the economy is good or not, whether my friends are there or if they have abandoned me, your eyes are to always be on the word of the Lord. If you were asked these three questions about the word of God, how are you using it? How well do you know it? And how are you being changed by it? What would your response be to those three questions? When we make it a practice, a routine to read the Bible, we are spending quality time with our Heavenly Father. We are in effect reading the letter He wrote for us. The Word of God changes us. It cuts through every thought and every attitude. How do you know if you're doing something right? Hold it up against the Word of God. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. God speaks in his word for us to be corrected, for us to know the ways of righteousness, for us to know how to navigate this life. 
The Bible tells us, John 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word of God has been there from the beginning of time as we know it. And the Bible is very clear. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And when you see the Bible as God's own words, then Hebrews 4.12 makes sense. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And here's why we need to take the word of God seriously in every aspect of our lives. The characteristics of the word of God is that it is living. It has life. It brings life. And it is life to the believer. God is the giver and source of life. The source of eternal life. Therefore, his word is just that. So how do you say you're a Christian but not have the word of God in you? You don't have life if it's not in you. And I mean when it's really in you, not just memorized, but when it tells you no, that's fornication. When it tells you no, that's pride. No, that's stealing. It corrects you when it's really in you. Just like fire, his word can refine you of all impurities. Just like a hammer, it destroys evil and builds and strengthens a godly character in your life. Just like a mirror, it exposes our blemishes against the true likeness of Christ. Just like a lamp and a light that guides us and gives us direction in life. Just like food, it provides nourishment. Man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from God. The word of God cleanses and washes over your life. It helps you to renew your mindset. Let's be encouraged to take the word of the Lord more seriously. Apply it to your life so that you may have direction, nourishment, and strength. My brothers and sisters, as sons and daughters of God, we need to speak God's word over our lives. Romans 15 verse 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So you and I should be speaking this verse over our lives and saying, the God of hope fills me with all joy and peace because I trust in him. And I declare that my life overflows with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 26 verse three says, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Make that verse yours and apply it to your own life. I am steadfast of mine. God does keep me in perfect peace because I trust in him. Psalms 103 verse 1 to 5 says, Praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. If we were to go back in time, right back to the days that Jesus walked the earth, there is an occasion where the Lord was speaking to a large crowd. And then the Bible says in Luke chapter 8, verse 41, And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter about 12 years of age, and she was dying. But as he went, the multitudes thronged him. And if we stop there for just a second, so here is Jesus with that distressed father. 
a father concerned about his little girl, and they are going to the man's house, perhaps hurrying since the girl was dying. Imagine the tussles with his disciples trying to make way through the crowd and all of the people around them. And in that crowd, there is a lady. I believe she was on her own because the Bible mentions nobody else with her. Now, this lady, no one knows her name, no one knows how she got there, and no one notices her. But she's on a mission. She has a problem that she's been dealing with, an issue that needs to be addressed. The Bible describes the woman as having a flow of blood for 12 years, and she had spent all of her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any. So she had tried the best medical minds within her reach. In fact, the Bible says she'd spent all her savings on doctors. None of them had been able to cure her, and now the bleeding is worse than ever. This was a woman who was not only suffering, but also desperate. And let me tell you something about crowds. Whenever you find a crowd, there are people there with different agendas. Just because you're in the same place, that doesn't mean you're of the same accord. It doesn't mean that you're unified simply because you're in a crowd together. Some people were in that crowd following Jesus because they wanted to be associated with the man who can perform miracles. Others were in that crowd to watch because they were skeptical about Jesus. Other people may have just been curious to see and hear from this Jesus that they heard can heal the sick, raise the dead, and give sight to the blind. But this woman was in that crowd for her own reason. She was in that crowd because she needed access to someone, to a power that could do what every other doctor had failed to do. So now she is pushing through the crowd. She is working her way forward. She is saying to herself, if I can only touch his garment, And as soon as she touched him, the bleeding stopped. And when Jesus turned, he asked, who touched me? He knew this touch was different from everyone else's in the crowd. This was a desperate touch, a touch of faith, a touch filled with hope and expectation. The Bible says when the woman grabbed at his coat, Jesus felt power had gone out from him. In all the jostle and press of the crowd, Jesus had detected that something was different. This touch was a different touch. All Jesus said to her is, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Be free from your suffering. Now, I want you to see how Jesus deals with people one by one. Each one of us are dealt with differently by the Lord. When he noticed power leaving him, Jesus didn't say to himself something like, That's good. Another person healed. No need to stop. The disciples will get the details, and I'll keep hurrying on to heal the little girl. No. Every time Jesus meets an earnest person, he gives them his full attention. One person is important to him. You are important to him. None of us is just another number or another name on a list. You are significant in the eyes of God. You are worth him stopping when you touch him with an earnest, sincere prayer. It doesn't matter if you are like this woman. It doesn't matter if you have no savings left in the bank, if the crowd you're in doesn't notice you, if you call on the name of Jesus. If you reach out in faith and touch him, he will give you his full attention. And it doesn't make any difference if you are the opposite. If you got it all together, if you're in a good place, and you don't need a healing, but simply desire a relationship. Jesus will meet your need with the same grace and power. Our Lord is good because he can pay attention to your need in any situation. This woman was in a crowd. She was approaching Jesus when he was busy with something else. Jesus wasn't told, Master, there's a special case you need to deal with before we go to Jairus' house. There was nothing like that. This woman was unknown. Jesus hadn't been paying attention to her. No one was paying attention to her. Everyone was thinking about the little girl. Yet, this lady's touch stopped Jesus in his tracks. He quickly changed focus. He turned and gave this woman the thing she desperately needed. So I encourage you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, you can come to Jesus anywhere at any time. If you have heavy burdens, Jesus said, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He can give rest. He can give you peace. 
he can make you whole. We don't have to be in a special place or perform a sacred ritual. He can meet a need even in the middle of a crowd. He can pay attention to someone on the side of a dusty road. He can be stopped by the smallest touch of sincere faith. Just as this woman went away healed and free, we can too, if only we touch the hem of his garment. Most people, in a time of struggling, in a time of despair, in a season of trials, will ask God to rescue them. They will ask God to deliver them. But what happens when you ask God to take this problem or situation away and he does it? What happens when you've told the mountain to move and it doesn't? What now? I'd like to submit to you that during these times, when trouble just doesn't go away, when the rain just doesn't stop, should our prayer actually be, Lord, go through this storm with me? Give me the strength to face this problem. Look at the three Hebrew boys who were thrown into a fiery furnace. God didn't deliver them from being thrown in the fire. God got in the fire with them. God didn't deliver Daniel from being thrown in the lion's den. God was there with him. Psalms 23 verse 4 says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even though I walk through, walk through, this isn't a case of saying, God, don't let me walk through the valley of the shadow of death, or God save me from the valley of the shadow of death. But it's even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The key part is for you are with me. And I want you to know that God is with you. 